Thanks. That, that was loud. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, Deb. So this is, this is a session which is going to focus on a couple of the key issues which the Higher Education Standards Panel is focusing on in its most current reference from the, from the Minister. Uh, there are th going to be three speakers. Um, first of all, um, Professor Peter Coldrake, a known, I think, to everybody in this room for his leadership in the higher education space and as a higher education uh, theorist, as well as a Vice-Chancellor for over 15 years. Uh, who's going to talk about the review of the provider category standards. That's obviously of central interest to HESP because we are, it's part of the higher education standards, the PCS, and the, and the um, panel is overseeing it. The second um, speaker will be um, Peter Noonan. Peter is chairing the review of the Australian Qualifications Framework, hence the second part, what's in a name? Sorry, what's in a qualification? Peter will, will, will discuss with you the nature of that review and, and some of the key issues. The two Peters will basically do both of that, have 10 minutes for that, those reviews. They're going to be sh very sharp reviews, obviously. Um, and um, Kerry Lee Krauss, uh, also known to, I imagine, almost everyone in the room as Deputy Vice Chancellor of La Trobe University, will speak to you, will be a respondent, will also pick up some questions from, from, the, from the audience at, at the end of the session. So, Peter, perhaps I can hand over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, I assume I, I can be heard. Um, it's good to be here. Um, so we have in Australia 170 higher education providers. Um, we have a number of categories. Um, the categories have been essentially unchanged for a long period of time. The origin was through uh, the national protocols um, period and of course confirmed through TEXA and, and so on. So we've got five categories of university and we have one category of higher education provider on the books at the present time. Um, interestingly enough, um, two or three of the university-related categories um, have basically an absence of activity uh, because almost everyone is concentrated in, in, the, in the space, uh, in, in the, uh, the public university space. Um, we have no university, uh, we have no university colleges, uh, we've got one university of specialisation and, and so on. So we've got 170 providers. Uh, people, tend to, people tend to focus on, well, are the categories for the universities adequate? Well, that's worth discussing. It's equally worth discussing whether a single category for 127 providers is also adequate. So I think both of those, um, both those matters um, happen to be um, live. I would emphasize that the review is about the categories. This is not some proxy uh, activity for funding model change. Uh, one, of course, understands the connection there between, but we're talking about the categories of activity, and we're essentially talking about the fit for purpose of the categories we, co we currently have for the future, um, bearing in mind that the current categories haven't changed uh, essentially over 20 years, but the higher education landscape has changed incredibly. There is, of course, an intersection uh, between the work that, that I'm doing and the work that Peter Noonan is leading, and he'll talk about, sh about that um, shortly, but provide, but provide you all with an assurance that we're very sensitive to the relationship of the two reviews, and issues like micro-credentials will be issues that, that Peter will deal with um, in his activity. Um, the, uh, the discussion paper, the Minister appointed me uh, in mid-October, um, and the, uh, the discussion paper, which will be distributed um, in relation to the review, will, um, is, is going to be distributed imminently, whatever imminently means. In, in other words, it's for all intents and purposes, it's done. Um, to try and give people a, a bit of a flavour, um, the discussion paper uh, provides some history, provides some context, provides all the statistics you'd expect, but points uh, in a number of directions for questions. Um, the, the first relates to the, well, they, they all really relate to fit for purpose in one form or another. Mm. Um, what, uh, what characteristics should define a higher education uh, provider and, and a university in that context? Uh, are, are the um, 
are the current categories fit for purpose? Um, and if there are no institutions falling in one or two of those categories, then that's a reasonable question to ask about whether those categories uh, should be retained or indeed whether new categories are required. Um, and ask people what their ideas for that are. But finally and importantly, um, to really seek the perspective of institutions, um, to different institutions to, to what's being proposed, what the attitude of the regulator um, is. Um, also, I think it's quite interesting to reflect on a moment um, what is a broader public interest served mm -hmm. here if there is a contemplation of changing the categories themselves. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, could, could I just pick up one question with you before we move on to Peter Noonan? Um, much of the time when I see the conversation and issues raised in relation to the standards and in relation to the provider categories, you, you picked up the issue of fitness for purpose and, and, and public interest. But one of the, what I regularly see raised is that we actually, you've talked about there's actually over, well over 100 higher education providers. Um, the issue was constantly raised that um, there's not enough diversity in the system. Did, did you want to, I mean, uh, get, <laughs> give me He's an angry man. <laughs> no, no, not any longer. Um, um, no, no, no. Uh, well, please give me my calming tablets. Um, look, so much of the focus of diversity, um, of the diversity discussion, is about the providers. Mm. Um, we get obsessed about the providers, and um, and I think we should actually just um, reflect in a serious way about the diversity debate in terms of for whom it matters, the students. Mm -hmm. Because we have, we've had on the books ambitious targets for improving participation in socioeconomic groups amongst indigenous people and so on for a long time. We've made pretty modest, pro we've made pretty modest progress in Globo, mm -hmm. and the challenges are still pretty immense. Uh, the further out from the central parts of the metropolitan area. So um, I'm a little tired, um, a little tired of listening to the discussions about um, the um, provider focus of diversity. I think we should think more about um, the students, hence the public interest. Right. So you'll be welcoming um, submissions which focus strongly on diversity when it's got the uh, students uh, in the front. I would suggest that people stick to the questions and, re and, re and remember, and, and the, they're also invited to speak on anything else that's on their minds, Mind, I should yeah, yeah. Um, But no, st stick to the questions, but just understand that we're doing a provider category review. We're not doing some other review. Sure. And I think probably when people see the document, one of the, it provides an excellent overview of the categories and of the system, but I think it, what it does very clearly from the, from the drafts that, um, Kerry Lee and I have both seen as being part of the panel, the absolute focus on public interest and the public and the pub, what public interest is served by any change that's provided. So I think that's particularly important. Um, Peter Noonan, can I? Thanks, Joanne. And, and I think I you've got a couple of slides. Just a few slides to run through. Um, so if we just move to the uh, move. Oh, I think I've got to do the clicking. <coughs> So um, I know that the uh, material for the conference is being circulated, so you'll get a copy of these slides. Um, and I thought it was probably important just to get some of the basic information out, um, because it is a fairly long and complex review. I don't need to go into uh, what the AQF is and what purpose it serves. I do need to um, indicate that there is an intersection with, of course, the provider category review. There's a major piece of work going on in the vet sector around the reform of, uh, of training products and, and reform of short courses and also um, a national process around senior secondary reform uh, which we need to uh, intersect with. On the right hand side is the, uh, the panel members and I should acknowledge in the audience, still I hope, listening to me, uh, my colleague Elizabeth Moore who is a member of the panel. Uh, so basically the panel is um, comprised of people drawn from the sector served by the AQF, um, but um, uh, it's an expert panel, it's not a representative body. Um, many of you will be aware, and for those who aren't, I would refer you to the review website. Um, there's a, an initial uh, report 
by Phillips KPA um, reflecting the views that they gathered from um, a range of discussions and interviews with, uh, with stakeholders as well as some research and some analysis of international frameworks. Uh, and that's a very useful background resource document, certainly it's been a very useful document for the panel and it has informed the terms of reference that I'll come to in a, in a minute. There's also a, um, a subsequent consultancy around pathways and credit transfer done by the Ithaca Group which is completed and which hopefully will be available shortly as well and it, it looked at practices in both the higher ed and vet sectors. The panel's full appointment, um, so four of us were appointed um, by the Commonwealth Ministers. Um, the, the previous Commonwealth Ministers before the change of Commonwealth Ministers um, and the, the final three at the bottom, uh, there was a delay in their appointment because of the change in the ministerial arrangements. Uh, so in fact, we didn't meet um, until October um, was our first meeting and we focused very much on getting a discussion <laughs> paper prepared. What we have to do is go through a fairly extensive consultation and um, review and investigation analysis process. But unlike um, my colleague, um, Peter, um, I've got the joy of having to steer this ship through um, two COAG ministerial councils, the Education Council and the, mm. the Skills Council. So, um, because the AQF is owned effectively by the states and territories, so it's a, it's a much more complex process. We also have to develop an imp implementation plan based on the uh, recommendations or the, out the outcomes once the ministers have considered it. Um, I won't go through why the review in detail, except that the Commonwealth did commit it to it when the AQF was Council was disbanded in 2014, but it is seven years since the review was, uh, the AQF was last comprehensively reviewed, and a lot's changed since then. The terms of reference, that's just a summary of them. But you'll notice, I think it's important in the um, terms of reference that there's what I would call a futures focus in the AQF, that is making a fit for purpose framework for the 21st century. But there's also a range of um, what you might call technical or um, specific issues relating to, um, which have often been there in the past, so things like volume of learning, the clarity of levels, um, is there overlap between the qualification level descriptors and the, and the level descriptors, the placement of vet and higher ed qualifications, um, and um, the, the new issue of um, uh, micro-credentials and how you, um, how you can aggregate qualifications. We also have to make recommendations on the AQF governance arrangements, but we probably won't do that until we actually look at the implementation plan mm -hmm. because there's no point in making recommendations about governance until we know <coughs> what, what it is that will be being governed. Um, the discussion paper, um, you see the smiley face, yeah. that's the optimistic, should be out soon. It's soon um, <laughs> earlier than imminent. That's tech, there's a technicality. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully soon and imminent. <laughs> Excellent news. Um, look, we've taken, um, because of the earlier consultancy that Phillips KPA did and yeah. the fact that people's views have been fairly widely canvassed, and certainly I've done the rounds and talked to a, a fairly wide range of people and the Phillips KPA report, we thought um, people aren't going to thank us for just going out and rehearsing all those issues all over again. So we've opted to put some possible approaches into the paper to chance our arm with some preliminary thinking from the panel. Um, but it's important to emphasise that that will not in any sense be our final thinking. Our, the approaches we're suggesting are very broad in nature. We've shied away from being too detailed and we haven't dealt with a whole range of implementation issues. But we're looking for proposals from providers, industry and students with submissions closing in early March 2019. Could I ask that in putting proposals forward that people responding think about the AQF as a whole, uh, rather than just saying you should change this bit of it or you should do this or you should do that, because a change in one part of the AQF can have knock-on effects um, to other parts of the AQF. Uh, the other comment I will make is that there are a range of issues like Peter where um, we will listen to what people are saying about the way the AQF is used and how it's, how it's governed and how qualifications find their way into it. But there are some things that we can't deal with in our terms of reference, yeah. including, including funding, sector governance, and frankly, the way in which individual professional bodies or um, in industrial awards and so on 
AQF qualifications are used for the purposes of occupational or professional alignment or professional regulation or professional certification. Um, the consultation process, we've deliberately, and um, we have the Minister's agreement <coughs> to make sure that the time frame for the review can be conducted in a way that means that we actually won't start the consultations until February and we, we need to be very mindful of the timing of the provider category review as well. We're sessions in each capital city and um, we're hoping also Albury and Townsville. Um, and once we've done those broader consultations, we will meet with um, peak bodies and um, um, uh, bodies like TESC, Sir and in the department and the people who've got to deal with implementation and so on, the HESP and other bodies. Um, we would actually like to, and, and state and Commonwealth governments, because we would like to try and make sure that the recommendations we're making have been mm. thoroughly worked through. It's an independent panel, but it will be done in a highly collaborative and transparent process, because there's no point in taking stuff to COAG ministerial councils, and then you only need one jurisdiction to object, or if you don't have Commonwealth ministers supporting what you want to put up, then the whole, the worst outcome from a COAG ministerial council is noted with more work to be done, which usually means um, it either never happens or it gets kick, kick, the can get kicked down the road. And then we'll have to consult further around the implementation plan. I won't go through these issues now because I think they should probably form the basis of, of the discussion. Mm -hmm. But just as an indication, uh, we will certainly address, I think, the major topic on everybody's mind, which is the options for um, and uh, advantages of inclusion of um, what's called micro-credential skill sets, short-form qualifications, um, but the issues there include quality assurance, how they align with the AQF levels and the relationship to existing qualifications. There's this general, um, uh, I mean, people talk about generic skills, future skills, employability skills, et cetera, et cetera. In the discussion paper, we're just referring to them as enterprise and social mm. skills, uh, which are clearly um, becoming increasingly important and increasingly prominent. That they are referenced in the AQF, but only in a fairly low-key way. The, the, the tricky thing, I think, for the panel is to work out what it is that should be included yeah. in the AQF, given the huge diversity of qualification yeah. types and the idea that you should have what, what some countries have done, which is to come up with a, a separate taxonomy or a separate set of um, uh, social enterprise skills, all of which have to be included in, in, in qualifications to us is, is challenging. Um, and the panel, frankly, is also taking a view, I think pretty consistent with the Chief Scientist's view, that essentially these things are best learned and applied in the context of, of major qualifications and in terms of what can be taught and learnt and, and assessed rather than getting too much into some of the personality traits and behavioural characteristics of people. We have to look at the qualification levels um, because there are some uh, lack of clarity in them. We need to look at the, um, at the, the taxonomy. Um, I, we, we think there's a problem with the third domain, which is around the application of skill. I, I won't go into the complexity of all of that, but it, it assumes the way skills are applied rises hierarchically with the same, with levels of skill and knowledge, and it's a fairly flawed assumption. It assumes that tradespeople, for example, would work with lower levels of autonomy than a professional, and that's just not the way the modern workplace works. And then I've referred to the Ithaca report, uh, so we will be dealing with pathways. But um, just to show a hand a bit, we will be canvassing the option of having an optionally referenced credit point system, so not a mandatory national one, but consistent with what some other countries have done, at least having a credit point system that would be embedded in the AQF that providers could align to and use al almost as a sort of set of exchange value, mm -hmm. um, and to try and deal with the volume of learning question in a slightly more sophisticated way. So I'll leave it there, Ian. Thank, Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter, and we'll come back to that in questions. I, I, you know, clearly the issue of credit transfer is incredibly important for everyone in this room. And it's certainly one of the issues that's been referred to um, for HESP to look at by the Minister. So if I can now ask um, Professor Kiri Lee Krauss, who is the Deputy Chair of HESP, um, to make some responding comments. Thanks, Ian. And uh, just one point before I go any further, the um, colleagues in the room may be wondering about the relationship between the Higher Ed Standards Panel and the two reviews. So we should perhaps just clarify that we are overseeing the provider category standards review as it relates to the higher ed standards framework and uh, having input into the AQF review. And uh, the two are obviously linked, so it's a great opportunity and good timing, I think, for us to 
be having this conversation to kick off uh, the, the consultations that will follow next year. So building on the flight theme of yesterday, I wanted to helicopter up and uh, take a look at these two reviews and the opportunities that they potentially offer us uh, not only as individual providers, but also as, uh, as a collective in the post-secondary space. Yesterday, David Lloyd reflected on the need for positive public discourse about higher education. And uh, following on the animal theme that he started yesterday, I might have detected a slight hint of pigs might fly in the tone when he reflected on the importance of thoughtful educational policy and purposeful planning. But I do think that in the way in which these two reviews have been conceived and in the timing of the two as they work uh, in parallel and together when, uh, when relevant, I think there is a fantastic opportunity for us as a sector to shape the thinking around higher education policy and to engage in purposeful planning and we certainly should give it a red hot go. So what opportunities do these two reviews offer us? I'd like to reflect on three things. First, uh, in relation to the provider category standards or uh, the PCS, as I'm sure they'll become very fondly known. David uh, talked about the teaching only university unicorn yesterday, otherwise known as an elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And I predict that through the discussions uh, of the PCS, there will be need to identify several elephants in the room, uh, to put them on the table, wherever they might, uh, li might land. And uh, I, I think that's an important starting point. Uh, as um, uh, has been mentioned in several contexts in this conversation over the last day and a half, the um, nature of the sector and the categories of providers um, really forms uh, a significant part of, uh, of the landscape that we're in right now. And I think that um, in terms of diversity, there is uh, an argument to be made in relation to Gwyn Davis's um, uh, thesis that there is no diversity in the university sector, but certainly within the university sector and more broadly across the higher ed landscape. I would say that uh, the PCS review is really going to uncover uh, and elicit a number of uh, important points in relation to that diversity that, um, that some say is not there, but I would argue in the higher education ecosystem we're uh, seeing a lot of diversity. So Peter, you may well need those calming tablets, but I'm optimistic about the quality of the debate that uh, the provider category standards review will encourage. On the, uh, the topic of the AQF review, uh, the other Peter, yesterday David Lloyd uh, made the comment that the AQF review needs to, quote, land in the right way. So it's an interesting question for us as a group today to think about what that means. What does it mean for the AQF to land in the right way? At one end of the spectrum, I've heard people say, if it ain't bro broke, don't fix it. It's doing just fine. We don't need to do anything about it. Others in the middle are saying, well, you could tinker around the edges and make a few amendments. And then at the other end of the spectrum, some are saying, this really is an opportunity for us to figure out what an AQF looks like and does in a disruptive and disrupted higher education landscape. So I think, Peter, there's an opportunity there to figure out across that spectrum how to engage different perspectives. And um, certainly uh, some view it as a white elephant. Uh, it's time has passed and, uh, and significant changes need to be made and I think you'll need to engage with that. But certainly the AQF debate will raise a number of questions about what a qualifications framework might offer in this higher education ecosystem. I'd like to finish with a couple of propositions from my own perspective. And I don't think I'm hallucinating or seeing pink elephants in the room when I say that the next 12 months genuinely will be a once-in-a-generation opportunity for us as a higher education land uh, uh, ecosystem. And uh, I think the public discourse is going to be critical. I think we do need to take hold of this opportunity rather than simply sit back and have a few voices 
engaged. I think it's going to be important for all of the voices around the sector to be involved. Why do I say that? Well, my first proposition is that quality, diversity, innovation and excellence in Australian higher education across provider categories are and will continue to be more important than ever. We're operating in a context where the fundamental question is what is higher and enduring about higher education? What can be trusted in higher education these days? And how do we know? And I think these two reviews go to the heart of those questions. And thoughtful, evidence-based debate is going to be key. My second proposition is that familiar concepts such as that of a university or a college, uh, a, a student from a higher education provider, a higher education experience, a higher education credential or a degree, I think those threshold concepts are being challenged and disrupted. And the discussion that we have about the AQF and the provider category standards, the discussion we have about things like the micro-credentials, the nano offerings, the unbundling and rebundling of credentials, I think those are going to be part of the broader landscape of what sort of provider category standards are going to be fit for purpose for this sector and what sort of qualifications framework do we need to be able to not only be resilient but innovative in the future. And uh, I think we're in for a very engaging 12 months and the challenge for each of us is how do we individually and collectively make our, va our voices heard. Thanks, thanks very much, Kerry Lee. Now, there have been a number of questions coming through on the screen in front of me. Um, I just wanted to pick up a couple in relation to the provider category review, um, Peter. So one of, one of those, I think, is quite, well, they're all enormously interesting, sorry. Um, but shouldn't provider categories be pathways with clear interconnections rather than a variety of destinations? There's sort of a, a, a comment underneath also saying, well, shouldn't we, is there a plan to review self-accrediting and non-self-accrediting? The, non -ex the existence of these two categories creates an immediate imbalance in the system. So I don't know whether you want to pick up on those, a couple of those themes in that. Okay. Then I'll come to you. Peter. So, um, thanks Ian. So there are 127 higher education providers of whom 112 or 115 are non-self-accrediting. So. Um, the answer to the question must be, it's a reasonable question to yeah, ask. Sure. Um, whether it's looked at in other ways as well, but I think that alone would suggest. Um, uh, with regard to the pathways part of the question, I mean, if we look at provider category standards in partly through the lens of students, then the answer's got to be at least a partial yes. Yeah. So uh, I, th I think it's got to be brought into the system. Um, uh, Kerry, Kerry um, it was... Um, using some metaphors about elephants on the rim, I was more perturbed about the one where the elephant was landing on the table. Mm. But that could but, be interesting. But but one of the one of the uh, one of those um, uh, life forms um, is certainly um, is certainly the conception we have of university in this country. That's mm. that's yeah. that's we've got a a strong conception that universities in this country are places of, of um, learning and teaching and research. Um, that doesn't mean that institutions and other categories may not participate in, in research or engage with it, but that's been the characteristic. That's also still internationally predominantly the case. The, it's not entirely, but it's predominantly. And so I think you, I mean, and, and the Australian system is also well understood and has some cachet so we've just got to be careful about uh, what we are wishing for if we change. I'm not saying we shouldn't dislodge it at all. I'm simply saying let's not forget the brand value we have and the understanding of the term. But, it's an, but I do think that, um, well, the discussion paper frontally, deal, frontally deals with the, um, the conception of university yes, in this country yes. as one part of this activity. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll ask you another question because it also relates to you, um, Peter Noonan. One of the questions that's just, just come up, is there any mention of the student voice in these two critical reviews? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. In, in, in the AQF review, and we'll be in the consultation process um, seeking to engage with the, um, um, the, the, the relevant student organisations in each 
um, in each sector. It's a bit more problematic in bed, of course, compared to the coverage that NUS has got in higher ed and the postgraduate student associations. That's one question. The second question is that we, we are talking about the architecture of the AQF, not individual courses and things mm -hmm. like that. But our focus is on institutions, students, and, and um, industry and society generally. Um, like Peter, we're not just focused on the um, point of view of, of the sector and the, and the providers. Peter, um, the, a, the answer is yes, but we're actually uh, very interested in, um, in receiving advice on how best to yeah. engage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can give a pretty easy yes answer, but it's how yeah. we best and most effectively yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, because I think most of us have found in the last number of years that students are making a contribution to, <coughs> to the university settings, to the learning environments in a way that historically wasn't the case. Yeah. So I think we've, we've got to listen to what people are telling us about how, yeah. uh, about the most effective ways to pursue that engagement. And just to reinforce Peter's point, um, the submissions and so on for these two activities are probably both going to be due about the same time, uh -huh. and that's probably going to be early March. So we are very aware that people at this time of year are exhausted with, with everything. Uh, for the year and budgets and so on. So it's, it's uh, indecent to ask for uh, comments immediately back, but we're hoping that tho those will be received by early March uh, and the consultations proper will occur um, you know, around the country in February, March. And on the student voice, Peter, I, I pick up what you said about the, the diversity angle uh, in terms of student diversity mm. in the sector and uh, across the providers. So I think that's a good opportunity for our various student groups, uh, including those closely involved with TEXA, to help us to figure out how to capture that input through the, the review. Thanks. And one of the qu there's a couple of questions coming up in relation to the AQF, but one of the issues that people often um, focus on is the whole issue of volume of learning. Did you want to comment on that, Peter? Oh, I'd be absolutely thrilled to. <laughs> <laughs> because it's only been around for 20 years or so. Right. Um, so the question is, I'm still mystified by the focus on volume of learning because cohorts are never homogeneous. Why can't the framework be designed to ensure that students demonstrate achievement of learning outcomes, but without trying to dictate any particular volume in the sense of input hours of learning? I think this is another one of those classic examples of be careful what you wish for, because um, I, the view we will I think be putting in the discussion paper is that to just take volume of learning out altogether and just to focus purely on um, student achievement against learning outcomes would uh, potentially have a major destabilising effect on the whole on the whole framework and particularly the way it's interpreted and understood internationally. Um, I think it, I don't see the two point. I don't see the point about student cohorts as being in contradiction to the concept of some volume of learning. If the volume of learning is a benchmark for um, um, a typical group of, say, new learners or novice learners, and it's applied by um, uh, self-accrediting institutions and by the regulators in a, in a way which reflects the, in the, the, the intent of the learning program and the nature of the learn learning co cohort. What do I mean by that? Well, in the VET sector, if there was an advanced diploma for a group of highly experienced um, workplace practitioners that embedded work-based learning and three um, sequential um, intensive seminars, um, that's a very different proposition to uh, an advanced diploma taught to a group of, um, of school students or, or people coming into uh, an occupation for the very first time. And it seems to me that in, in applying the volume of, um, volume of learning measure, um, we, we have to keep some set of reference points in the AQF so that for the, for the purposes of um, distinguishing and, and, and not just ending up with a whole set of unintended consequences, but then just main, making sure, and this ultimately applies to people responsible for quality assurance, that it's applied in the, in the way it's intended to be applied. That is not as a rigid measure, it does it every course has to conform to that length, but it does have relevance to the nature of the learner cohort engaged in the program. Um, um, and uh, I, I think that's probably the sensible way forward. I mean, personally, I've just seen too many, um, the effects of too many changes uh, where the consequences on, of, of, of sudden and major changes in frameworks or policies or funding systems haven't been properly thought through um, and, and you get practices and provider behaviours or advantages being taken 
uh, by some within the sector, which end up bringing, uh, bringing the whole deck of cards down. So uh, I think we will we'll be taking a, a, a sensible and judicious approach to it. And your response to that in one sense also responds to a question about the future proofing of the AQF, particularly in relation to life and work experience. Yes, again, it's, the, the, the issue is if you took something, so the question's around embedding life and work experience, and that gets us into this whole question yeah. of broader attributes and capabilities. The question that we'll be putting in the discussion paper is to what extent should these things be um, specified, outlined and required in the AQF? Um, should, should they just be more clearly spelled out than in the current AQF, but then um, it, it made clear that in fact the way in which they play out varies a lot between, there's a very big difference between a senior secondary certificate mm -hmm. and a, um, a, a postgraduate um, diploma for in a highly specialised area for people who are already experienced professionals in the area that they're gaining a qualification in, who for example might object to being told that they need to have their resilience increased or something like that in the course of getting the qualification. So again, I think it's, it's, it's recognising the AQF is, is a framework. It's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a core syllabus. It's, ne it's not something which requires content. It basically sets a framework against which qualification can, can be de developed, aligned and regulated. Um, thanks, Peter. There's a couple of questions coming through in relation to the conception of the university. Uh, I'll just pick up one of them. Sort of also questions about Glyn's concepts. But the one that I'll pick up, Peter, is isn't the conception of a university constrained, driven by the way international rankings are formulated and the fact that everybody com um, competes on that playing field? I mean, I think one of the important things about your discussion paper, or the draft of the discussion paper, is that it actually does look at the concept of the university and how that, the Australian concept, fits into an international context. Did you want to comment on that? Um, no, that's and Deb, you might think about when you want us to stop, so... Mm. Two or three minutes, okay. So this will probably be the last question, yeah. Well, I think, I think that is the real politique. That, that, is, that is the setting. Um, I mean, my, my only other comment to make, uh, it, well, I'm accepting the setting, and I'm also saying that we also s see the journey of rankings. Um, and what we all know about rankings is, and probably can agree, is the more the merrier. Because they started out with a particular purpose. Um, and uh, increasingly, uh, particularly as they have to respond to the interests of students and the quality of learning, mm -hmm. so they will measure different things mm -hmm. over time and be understood to do different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I, I think so. The more the the more the the better, and the better for the student market that there be a lot. So I think we might actually pull it up there. So thank you. Well, I, are you going to do a formal thank you? Thank you. Uh, Please thank the panel. <laughs> Easy. Thank you.